All right. So today I have the real pleasure and honor to meet you, Colin Campbell. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so uh, excited to have you here today as my guest. Now, Colin, as I do with all my guests, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Who are you? Yeah, so um, I'm a I'm a writer and director uh, for theater and film out in Los Angeles. And also I'm a professor of theater and film. So I teach theater directing and screenwriting and filmmaking. Um, and I'm married, my wife's Gail, and, uh, and we had two children. We had two teenagers, Ruby and Hart. Uh, Ruby was 17 and Hart was 14 when they were both killed. Uh, and so when you ask, who am I, who am I, or tell me, you know, tell me, if you, and you ask me to tell me about myself, I'm going to, first thing that pops in my mind is that, I, you know, I'm a dad. Um, but in this case, I was a dad, my, you know, my, I'm still am, but my, but my kids were killed, but that's such a part of my core part of my identity. When someone asks, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, the first thing I think about is that uh, I'm a dad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, so it was a car accident, right? A drunk driver? Yeah, so I, I don't I don't use the word accident. I call it a car crash because to my mind, the woman who, who killed my kids, she didn't it wasn't accidental that she got drunk and then high and, and it wasn't an accidental that she got behind the wheel. She made those choices. Um so I so I call it a car crash. Yeah. Yeah, and what happened after that? So obviously the car uh, crash happened and, and how did your life take a turn after that moment? Well, it, it you know, it, in one sense, my life ended um, when my kids were killed. My, my identity was shattered and my sense of who I was and, and what I was doing here on earth <laughs> was shattered. And I had to reconnect, rebuild, discover um, a, a sort of a new path forward. Um, and also just learn how to grieve. I, I didn't really know how to grieve. I didn't know what grieving was. Um, and so there was this process where I, I was trying to understand <laughs> what had happened to me. Um, it, it, there's such a strong, I think such a strong um, feeling of denial in the early days after, after you lose somebody, especially suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, it's it's really hard to accept that this is real, that that this is reality. Um, even now, there's a there's a part of me that just doesn't want to believe it. It just seems too crazy because I'd spent so much of my life thinking about Ruby and Hart and their futures, um, and now I, I I'm not allowed I'm not allowed to. There is no future for them on Earth, and so um, yeah yeah a lot of that was struggling with denial. Mm. And you were talking about it's hard to grieve. How did you find the people around you were sort of reacting to to your situation? Yeah, well, they. I think a lot of people were very, very scared uh, of of Gail and I, and also of of hurting us. They didn't really know what what to say to us because they were so worried that they would cause me more pain by saying you know quote unquote the wrong thing. Um, I think I think there was a lot of fear uh, because even like an in, in you know a seemingly uh, innocuous statement like "How are you?" I think part of them thought maybe I might snap at them. How how dare you ask me that? How do you think I am? My kids were just killed, um, and so I discovered that I really wanted to talk about grief and about Ruby and Hart. I really wanted to have people to talk to, and so. When I saw how scared people were to talk to Gail and I, something inside me said, well, I've got to try and fix the situation so that I can have conversations with these people. Um, and that's where I developed my what I call my grief spiel uh, mm -hmm. that Gail and I both use. And it's sort of like a, I like the word grief spiel. It, it sounds kind of playful because spiel is play in German and it's just it's a playful way of of describing what it is, which is essentially telling people what the deal is like, here's the deal. Um, and, and that that could change as as our grief changed. But in the early days, it was very much like we need to talk about Ruby and Hart. 
we need to talk about our grief. And there's not a lot of room for me to talk about your problems. I don't have a bandwidth to talk about your grief um, or about politics or weather. I kind of, I'm in a, I'm in a crisis, honestly. I'm, I'm in acute grief and I'm in, I'm in crisis mode and uh, I need to talk about it. It's too monumental to just sort of pretend that it's not happening, you know, mm. to let it be like a white elephant in the room that nobody talks about. So it must have been quite hard because obviously people were tiptoeing around you not mm. knowing how to behave, what to say. Uh, yeah. What does this do to, you think, in society? Well, I think I think it's a it's a complicated sort of toxic mix. <laughs> um, on the one hand, I think a lot of times film and television show people in profound grief uh, wanting to be alone and and saying, you know, don't talk about the person who's dead. How dare you, you know, don't even say their name um, and being very angry and and stay away from me. And I think we all receive those messages and think, oh, well, that's what people in grief are like and that's what they want. And then, ironically, <laughs> for part of grief, that is what we want. You know, there, there's definitely an early grief, a period where you don't want to deal with other people and you do push them away. Um, I'm generalizing here, but I think it's very common. And uh, and I think people receive that and think, oh, okay, so Colin doesn't want to talk to me today, so he probably doesn't want to talk to me ever. <laughs> I'll wait until he tells me when he wants to talk to me. And that's when I think the trouble can arise because that's when when, when rifts can, can appear between people. Um, because if a lot of time goes by, suddenly the griever's like, why aren't they reaching out more? Like, yeah, I didn't want to go for a walk with them last Wednesday, but how about today? Why are they still staying away from me? So that kind of, I think, can reinforce that sense of like isolation and let's leave the griever alone. And then I think there's also just, um, well, there's, there's the fear of hurting them more. There's a fear of saying something that's going to make them feel more pain. And I think that is, is mistaken because we're, get, we're in pain. It, you know, we've lost someone that's very dear to us. We're in pain. You saying something to me is not really going to, quote unquote, trigger me because I'm already triggered. I'm, I'm in grief. I'm thinking about Ruby Hart all the time. And if you might mention Ruby and Hart, yeah, I might, I might tear up, but I cry all the time. And what's so bad about that, you know? Um, uh, so, so there's that, that sense of like, uh, let's not talk to the grievers because I don't want to upset them more. And then I think there's also an element of um, just discomfort. People avoid discomfort. It's uncomfortable to be around me at times. You know, I'm, I'm, I can be happy and jovial and make jokes, but I, I'm also uh, going to want to make it real now and again <laughs> and just talk about things that are kind of scary and uncomfortable. And people in general avoid discomfort. So that's yeah, my long-winded response. <laughs> yeah, and I think as well when you came into the grief that you became your authentic self, all the masks sort of fell off. You know, there was a raw right. you. Yeah, and, yeah. And that can be very scary as well to for people around you to see your true authentic self, right? Yeah, yeah. I had no masks on. That's a great way of putting it. Because um, suddenly, like, social niceties don't seem so important. <laughs> I think when you're in acute grief, you're dealing with life and death and elemental forces and, you know, the casual niceties um, don't seem so important. Mm. So if we look at grief, it's, you know, we all experience grief as part of life. Uh, to, yeah. we, we're all going to lose someone. Uh, and that's, the, you know, can happen early in life or later in life. But grief is such a big part of life right so how do we need to make grief more acceptable that it's normal to talk about it and to to be our authentic self when we are meeting and encounter someone who's experienced what you just experienced uh, what is the approach yeah well i think um i think what you said was is really great the idea of of normalizing you know you're right everybody's going to grieve and 
I think it doesn't help to keep it secret, to make it taboo, so you don't talk about it. So, so you whisper behind the person's back, oh, so-and-so has lost so-and-so, and, but don't talk to them about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's just yeah. keep this thing like a secret. Uh, and I think, like I said, it's sort of the white elephant in the room. And I think that that is harmful. I think that makes people who are grieving more confused about it. You know, it seems more mysterious because they haven't heard about it. They haven't encountered it in their lives uh, until it hits them. And then it feels like, what do I do? That's how I felt. I felt I felt lost. I didn't know how to grieve and I, I had no role models of grieving that I could draw on. Um, and so I think talking about it, I think like like podcasts such as yours, uh, where we're just talking about grief and it's not it's not as scary when we're talking about it, you know, I think. I think it, it makes it feel less scary. Mm. Well, I lost my mom when I was 12. Uh, so I was oh. on the other side of the spectrum. So I can fully understand your, your emotions and, and that loss and the panic and the whole grief process. Uh, yeah. And as you say, you never stop thinking about, you know, them. Um, yeah. But this led you to writing the book, Finding the Words, right? Uh, so it's actually, you turn this whole very sad situation into something very beautiful where you're now contributing to the world oh. by sharing oh, your experiences you. <laughs> and, and, you know, becoming a light. So how was it when you started finding that book? Did you How did you get the idea of writing the book and, and what did that journey look like? Yeah. Well, I uh, I went to grief groups, and uh, I found it very useful. I found it very helpful to be in a grief group. Um, it was hard, especially at first. It was hard. I didn't want to be a part of this group, right? I, I, I didn't want to be somebody with, that was a parent of a dead kid, but that's what I was. And so um, it took a while to accept that. And then I got a lot of nourishment from these grief groups. But I saw a very common thread, which was that a lot of times we'd go around the circle and we'd share our losses and we'd talk about the aching and the yearning and the disbelief. Um, and then conversation would very quickly turn to people feeling abandoned, uh, that their, their friends and family were letting them down. They were isolated. They couldn't talk to anybody about their loss. And, uh, and then they would say it to, to me, that you're going to lose all your, you're going to lose many of your friends. Uh, you're going to find out who your true friends are because most of your friends are going to fade away. And I felt like uh, I knew my friends loved me. I loved my friends. They loved Ruby and Hart, and even more importantly. <laughs> and I didn't want to lose them. I didn't want to have that happen. And um, and I thought that Gail and I were developing these tools that that were helping us keep our friends and family close. Um, and part of it was being open about our needs, about our emotional needs, and doing the sort of socially unacceptable thing of, of just telling people, this is the deal. Uh, we need to talk about these things. Um, and we need your help. Can you help us? And, uh, and for me, the stakes were so high that a little bit of social awkwardness wasn't such a big deal. I was scared I was going to lose my mind. Um, I was terrified I was going to lose my mind and I needed my friends. Uh, I needed to be able to talk to them. And so uh, we found that that these tools helped us keep our friends. Uh, and obviously the, there's no uh, magic bullet. You can't, you can't magically keep all your friends while you're grieving. Uh, some friends are just not going to be able to be there with you. They're just not going to be emotionally available. But, um, but we found taking certain steps certainly helped helped keep a lot more of our friends. Um, and I thought that was worth sharing. Mm. Uh, yeah. So that was sort of the initial impetus for writing the book. And then I just found that I had a lot to say about grieving, <laughs> not just that part, but, but other aspects of grieving. I just wanted to share. It helped me. It helped me to just sort of think about my own thoughts about grief. And then I also got to share a little bit about Ruby and Hart in the book and that that helps me. That helps me to know that there are people reading my book out there in the world and learning about Ruby and Hart and thinking about them. Yeah, it helps. So it's almost like 
you just want to be seen and heard for who you are, your true authentic mm. self again. So it's almost yeah. like this book has sort of given you the tools how to teach others that you are now authentic. And this is how I want to be treated. I want honesty. I want you to be yourself. And if I feel in a certain way, I will tell you directly. There's yeah. nothing to be scared of, you know. Uh, I want to maintain our friendship. So you're just expressing your needs and your wants. Uh, isn't that what we all should do, whether we have grief or not? <laughs> I, I kind of think that, yeah. Yeah, I do. I think so. Like, let's, let's share from? our needs. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, I love it. I think so. I think it's true. I think that a lot of the misery in the world comes from people who um, keep their own needs secret um, out of shame or fear um, or, or avoidance, avoidance of discomfort. And in the end, I think you, you suffer more as a result. Yeah, mm, so I agree. And, and grief doesn't have to be death either. It can be grieving. Uh, you know, you could have a parent who's still alive, but doesn't give you the love that you need. Yeah, or, absolutely. Uh, or you feel abandoned. Uh, you are neglected. That is also yeah. grief. Uh, yeah. I think you can grieve, book... for, grieve for things that you don't, that you're not going to get. You know, um, for whatever reason, you, you you know, you're grieving the potential that you don't, uh, you're not going to be able to access for whatever reason. Yeah. Or you might be in a marriage where you're not having your needs met, fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you can also just grieve the, the loss of a marriage if it falls apart or. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you were mentioning as well, you ended up in a crisis. So. Most of us go through a life crisis, right? At some point. What has been the so. most valuable lesson that you have learned from your crisis? I think the value of, of a community, the value of, of being connected to other people. Um, I think that losing Ruby and Hart, on the one hand, sort of because I was in still in such terrible, terrible pain, it, it sort of reinforces the idea of just how important they are to me, my kids, you know? Um, and, and the sense of my own identity is mixed in with them. Like I am who I am because of them. They're part of me and we're interconnected in that way, if that makes sense. Um, and it made me sort of think on a broader term that that we're interconnected with everybody that that we love they they've helped shape who we are and um and the line between me and heart yeah, it's a little murky to my mind um so uh and the other the other part that that i learned about the community is like grieving i didn't want to do it alone uh so my wife is jewish and i'm not jewish but we raised ruby and heart as jews uh, and they were born about mitzvah and we're, we're active members of our, of our synagogue. And I decided to just follow the Jewish rituals of mourning when I was mourning Ruby and Hart. Uh, I figured they had thousands of years to figure this out. <laughs> I was going to listen to my rabbi. She's very wise. And, um, and I'm so grateful that I did that. <laughs> and it really taught me that grieving is not something you do on your own. I mean, obviously you spend lots of time on your own grieving, but but the parts that you can do in community are so helpful. Um, so just uh, my birthday is, is tomorrow. Uh, and every year I have a gathering at the beach and it used to be a, just a joyful gathering of friends and family of, uh, and, and friends of Ruby and hearts. And now it's a, it's a gathering to memorialize Ruby and heart. Um, and so, the Sunday, just two days ago, I was surrounded by, you know, dozens and dozens of, of friends who loved me and loved Ruby and Hart. And we held hands and we said Ruby and Hart's names together and we spelled their names out in, in rocks in the sand. And um, it was a hard day, but also I was so grateful to have all these people with me. Mm. And how have you been handling the anger? I can imagine the anger you have felt towards this 
drunk driver, right? How yeah. has it been to deal with that anger? Yeah. Thanks for asking. I um I don't think I've I've ever really been that good with anger. I don't know what that means, but I, I just feel like I get scared of my own anger. I feel like I'm out of control when I'm angry. Uh I don't I don't like it. Um it doesn't I don't feel empowered when I'm angry. I feel just kind of chaotic, <laughs> unhappy. And um and I have I have to deal with so much anger. Um I actually find that I don't think about that drunk driver too much. Um, I don't know. It just seems like a dark hole there. I don't, I don't like thinking about her and, um, but I still feel all this anger and it kind of bubbles up and comes out in other places. Um, and I don't, I don't like it, <laughs> uh, but it's definitely something that I struggle with. And, uh, and I, I do try to, counteract it with kindness. Um, sounds very Pollyanna or very, I don't know what optimistic, but uh, it does help me when I'm feeling angry to try and take a step back and, and do something kind, even though I don't really want to. Um, because that it helps dissipate the anger. Because I don't know what to do with it. It's just it's rage at the universe, right? The universe took away my babies. Um, and, and and it comes out, I'm, I'm angry, I'm angry at someone does some small slight, you know, somebody, somebody just says something rude to me in the in the parking lot. And I just see red, I just, I just so my head explodes. Um, I want to just scream at them, you know, my kids were murdered, I, I'll kill you. You know what I mean? Like, that's what comes to my mind. And it's just like, dude, he just was, you know, he just was cut in front of you in line or whatever it is. But um and so I, I try uh, not to, I, I don't say that. I don't scream at people. <laughs> My children were murdered. I don't do that. Um, and I try not to dwell in that place, you know, but it's definitely a struggle. You had to become very self-aware as well about your triggers because a trigger can come at any time, anywhere. Yeah. So you have to sort of master your, master yourself, self-mastery as well. Uh, yeah. Imagine uh it's been a long journey and a, a road of uh, many insights and exploration acceptance mm -hmm. and faith yeah I, I think it helps to think about the grieving process um uh you know writing the book just kept me engaged with it so i'm, I'm thinking about it i'm thinking and I'm thinking about, you know, my book is called Finding the Words, and I think it really helps to think about what are the right words to express how I'm feeling. Um, and, and it's not easy. It's not always easy to find the right words. Like, what exactly am I feeling right now? You know? Um, and that journey, like you said, that journey of exploration um, has helped me to not compartmentalize or, you know, bottle up the feelings or or try and deny the feelings. Yeah, and it's almost like society has programmed us to not talk about emotions. It's almost like you're weird mm. if you talk about your emotions and how you feel. Whereas yeah. the human basic need to talk about how you feel. Uh, you can't suppress your emotions because that will turn into depression, you know, and, and eventually it can even manifest into disease like cancers, etc. So it's very normal for us human beings to talk about emotions and how we feel. Yeah. Uh, and what do you think we need to do in the world to, to get to that point where it is okay to express how you feel and your needs and your wants without feeling shame and being judged and yeah yeah i think normalizing it i think having these you know potentially uncomfortable conversations um in public you know the public figures talking about their grief um I, th I think it helps. I think it helps. Um, and, and just having understanding and compassion. Um, I think there's a lot of very, you know, there's a whole, the anonymous world of the internet where people can just say however they feel and, and send these toxic messages at people. And, um, and I think, 
I'm not sure exactly how to counteract that, <laughs> but um, but that's what we need to do um, to have people thinking through a lens of compassion when they're interacting with other people. You never know what other people are going through. Um, you never really know why someone is suddenly furious <laughs> in the supermarket. It might be me. <laughs> I might be struggling with something really, really big. Um, yeah. Mm. So have some compassion. Mm. Amazing. Thank you for being so authentic and sharing your grief journey as well. Uh, what is your advice to people out there who are going through a loss at the moment uh, and are really struggling? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think I think it's uh, starting with finding community so you're not so alone. You know, I think that the there's a there's a natural pain of grief. We lost somebody that we love. They're not here on earth with us. And that's a loss and that's going to hurt. And there's no way around it. You can't minimize that pain. You can't take that pain away. Uh, you can't fix that pain. That's just the pain of loss and we have to feel it. But there's so much suffering that goes along with that. Uh, and it comes from feeling abandoned, um, feeling stuck in toxic relationships that aren't helping with the grieving process. Uh, it comes from treating ourselves poorly, right? not taking care of ourselves as we're grieving. Um, you're not eating right, not sleeping right, um, abusing alcohol or drugs. Um, all these things lead to suffering that's not part of grief. It's something else on top of it. Um, and so the more you, I think the more somebody who's grieving can avoid or minimize those attendant sufferings, um, the, the healthier their grieving process will be and ultimately um, will allow them to not feel stuck um, or, or self-destructive mm. as they grieve. Mm. And you found your community as well. Uh, how, how quickly did you find a community? How, after, how long did it take you to, to get into that community after the loss? Mm. Well, I, I, so I, I think Gail and I really kept our old community because we told them what we needed and they stepped up. Um, they, they were all, every person we told our needs to were so grateful that we told them um, because they wanted to support us. They just didn't know how. Um, so that was helpful for us to know that what we were doing was helpful to them too. And then, um, and then we joined grief groups pretty quickly. Uh, I know we went to our first grief group three weeks after the crash and that felt a little too early for us. Um, it was a hard, it was a hard session for us, uh, to be around so many other people in pain. Um, and there were a couple of very strange exchanges. <laughs> Um, at that grief group, because it's unfortunate, you, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And, um, and I remember there was there was a mom who lost a kid and and we were in the circle and she looked right across the circle, right at us. We were new. We just got there. We didn't know what we were doing. And she looked right at us and said, like, you know, have have faith in the future. I lost my son, but but I have a daughter and another son and they have kids and now I have grandkids. And so life can get better. And we're like, lady, we lost both our children. We don't have any kids. We don't have any grandkids. That's over. We're too old. Like, it was really upsetting because <laughs> she was trying to be helpful, you know, and trying to take away our pain with some promise that we're never going to have. Um, so that was pretty brutal. Um, that was the only bad, bad thing we ever had happen to us at a grief group, I think. It was the first one we went to. But... Um, but then I think maybe it's like two weeks after that, we went to a different grief group uh, and that was helpful. And then we went to, uh, went to a bunch. Yeah. So we found, we found our community with people who are grieving and we also kept our community of friends and family. You said something beautiful there as well. You said that your friends appreciated you being honest and telling them how to respond to you and what you yeah. need at that time, which sort of kept the relationship intact. Uh, 
because you don't want to lose more people in your life that are close to you if you're already going through a massive loss. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's hard because, you know, we are also angry. Like you said, we're angry. We're angry at the world. We're angry at our friends. They get to go on with their lives and they have kids if they have kids and um, and we don't. Um, but these are the people that love us and love Ruby and Hart. <laughs> so we have to find a way to not be mad at them. <laughs> um and uh and keep them close and how is this relationship between you and your wife how has that been uh, after the loss yeah we i think we both agree that we're we're even closer than we were before because we've we're going through such a catastrophic event together we're we're the sole survivors of the car crash you know um and and the survivors of this crash that that hit our lives um and i think part of why we were drawn so close is that we talk about our grief to each other um we talk endlessly <laughs> about how we feel and about ruby and heart um we just take long walks and talk or talk in bed or every day we talk about how we're doing how we're feeling um and being our authentic selves like you said um and so you know in a sense our, our marriage is stronger now um but i would trade it <laughs> i would trade everything to be the way it was before and have ruby and heart but yeah yeah um now colin what is the biggest fear you have faced in your life or have this is my standard question uh as you know <laughs> yeah well yeah my my biggest fear is uh i didn't even have a fear that i would lose ruby and heart because it wasn't even on my radar i i it was like impossible I, I i didn't think about it you know what i mean that that was never going to happen um and uh and so and then they were killed and i guess at that point i uh i feared that i was going to lose my mind that i was going to go crazy that i was going to that if i started weeping i would never stop um i would just go till i died or went crazy i don't know what <laughs> um and i think those fears are not we're not we're not realized i i didn't go crazy um I wept and then stopped weeping um, and then wept again and stopped weeping um, comes in waves. Um, and now, I, you know, there's a part of me that uh, there's a part of me that's fearless because, you know, my, my attachment to life is a little uh, uh, or a lot more tenuous than it ever was before. Um, uh but that said i i don't want to die um uh yeah i, I want to live i want to live with with gail and i want to keep honoring ruby and heart and then find find new love you know in the world so you become more present you take one day at a time you're not yeah yeah i, I think so i think you take one day at a time yeah it doesn't feel quite that dire that makes it sound like I'm on, I'm like just barely holding on. I don't think I am. I think I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing better than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in fact, Gail and I were, we're, uh, we're fostering to adopt two, two teenagers. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's, that's our journey now is to find a, you know, make a, a new family that, honors and remembers ruby and heart but this is different this is a new a new chapter the, these kids are not ruby and heart we don't want them to be ruby and heart uh we're not we're not replacing ruby and heart um but we do want to be parents and um and it's very hard it's a hard path <laughs> fostering uh teenagers is, is tricky um and then grieving while fostering teenagers is like extra tricky wow. um but uh but i think we're making it work yeah yeah so how long have you been fostering these teenagers do, do they live with you yeah 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 they're wow. upstairs they're asleep right now <laughs> Amazing. um 
uh, yeah, uh, the brother's 13 and the sister's 12, and they've been with us for eight or nine months now. I guess nine months now. Yeah. Are they like uh, siblings? Yeah, they're siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult for them, you know. Um, nobody wants to be in the foster system. It's not their choice. It's not anything that they did, right? They're, um, they're also uh, victims of trauma. Um, and they've had trauma since they were very young. So it's a, it's a hard path for them. Um, but we have some good times, we have some good adventures. They were there at the beach on Sunday and they put rocks in for Ruby and Hard and um, it was nice. That's just lovely, beautiful. So you found a new meaning, a new chapter, uh, a new mission. Um, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that reconnecting with meaning and purpose is, is tough after, after a, a big loss, after a catastrophic loss. Um, it's, it's hard to, you know, find a reason to live, right? What, what is our purpose on earth here now? I thought it was one thing and it's not. So, um, and I, I think the search for meaning comes from out, looking outside at other people. Um, that's where we're going to find our meaning. Um, yeah. Where do you hope we are in 10 years from now? We like the planet. Yeah. The planet. <laughs> Human. The planet. Mankind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I hope we're, we're more open about our feelings. Um, yeah. More compassionate. Um, I think we need extra doses of compassion to counteract the, the social media, um, the, the, the trolls on social media. How, how do we, how do we manage to navigate that um, and not, you know, get overwhelmed with self-loathing because you're receiving all these sort of potentially negative toxic comments. Um, I, I haven't, by the way, I haven't received negative toxic comments online, but I know that other people do, and especially young people. Um, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, fear. And you mentioned compassion as well, and I can imagine your journey has been very humbling. Um... Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I was not a great friend to people in grief or feeling loss or struggling. I didn't know what to say to them. And I think I backed away. I, I, I was fearful and didn't, I didn't want to engage with people. Um, I, I was just, you know, thought, oh, they want to be left alone. And, <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to say anyway. And, um, and so I, I feel um, a lot of compassion for people who are struggling to say the right thing to me, you know, what to say to me, because I was in their shoes for sure. Um, yeah. So basically, you don't want to be left alone. You want your friends to still contact you as normal, but perhaps ask you, how do you want me to respond to you? What do you need from me? Yeah, yeah. And um, I think people worry that they, they have to come up with the right thing to say that's going to solve the situation or take away their pain or fix the problem. And, and that's when people say the wrong thing. Because because any any attempt to fix my pain is going to inevitably try and minimize it, right? They're trying to look on the bright side, so that's sort of basically saying, "So stop crying. <laughs> it's not so bad. Stop. Don't, it's, it's it's good now. Whatever it is, it's it's minimizing my loss." And that's when I, I get upset. Um, but if if you're with somebody who's in grief, don't try and fix their fix their pain, but be there for them. Yeah, offer to let's go. For, you want to go for a walk? We can talk, um, and then be a be a good listener, um, and and ask good questions, and then also share. If you if you knew the person who died too, you have a story to tell them. You know th that's beautiful. Um, you know, or, or if you also loved that person who died, and you can share how heartbroken you are. Um, you know, it's so strange. I, I used to say. 
Uh, I love seeing kids cry. Like I love seeing Ruby and Hart's friends cry, you know, because I didn't feel so alone. I felt like Ruby and Hart were loved. They are loved, you know, look at their friends are all crying. Good. <laughs> it seems mean, but it's like, yeah, we should, the whole world should cry over Ruby and Hart, right? Um, and so, uh, and kids always, kids were always great. Uh, you know, adults would hang back and not say anything, and the kids would just say, I love Hart, I love Ruby, and then share a story. Um, and that was like the best thing, <laughs> the best thing I could hear. Um, some friend of theirs sharing a story that I didn't know about my own kids, uh, and then having them tear up. <laughs> I loved it. I still do. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Yeah. Well done uh, to you and your wife for uh, being such great ambassadors for grief and inspiring the world to become more authentic and compassionate. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Is there anything else, Colin, you'd like to say as a final word to anyone out there? Uh, yeah, well, just two days ago, I think, was the... Um, I think it was a World Suicide Prevention Day. Uh, and so I'm going to leave with the, with the word of um, choose life. Um, because, you know, you might think that the world will be better off without you, but it won't. People will be in agony and pain for the rest of their lives. So stay with us. <laughs> It'll get better. It'll change. Uh, stay with us. Choose love. Love it live life yeah yeah thank you so much oh, thank you thank you for having me Viv. i really no, appreciate it. this is a nice conversation <laughs>